Unique people leading unique lives shape and inform Iowa City. This community is enhanced by these women and men who live in our midst, working, teaching, creating. Welcome to a series of conversations with people who have stories to tell. Join my guest and me, Ellen Buchanan, in a series of interviews called One of a Kind. Professor Valerie Ligorio has led at least 10 lives. Her vocations and avocations have included student, secretary, singer, hula dancer, musical performer, actress, CIA secretary in Berlin, no less, linguist, disc jockey, nurse's aide, editor, scholar, and teacher. Born in Iowa City, Valerie traveled, lived, and worked around the world. Her father was career military. When she was in her late 30s, Professor Ligorio returned to college, graduated summa cum laude from San Francisco College for Women, and went on to Stanford University to earn her MA and PhD. And in 1972, she came to Iowa City to teach medieval studies at the University of Iowa. Valerie is a winner of numerous academic awards. Two Feshrifts, collections of essays, have been published in honor of her long tenure as teacher and scholar. She won a Best Teachers Award from the University of Iowa. She was the founder of 14th Century English Mystics Newsletter and editor of Mystics Quarterly. In 1992, the Valerie M. Ligorio Graduate Student Scholarly Award Fund was announced to honor Professor Ligorio's contributions to medieval scholarship. She has served as a member of many professional societies, served on editorial boards of various publications, authored numerous articles and book reviews. And since her retirement, she volunteers for hospice, is at the Iowa City Senior Center, winning a Senior Center Award, and other community programs. Oh, that was some, <laughs> that is some life you've led in our leading, Professor Ligorio. And you've come full circle. You were born here in Iowa City. You went away, had adventures, and now you're back working mm -hmm. and, and, and retiring, too, and working. Um, what a life you've been living. Tell me a bit about your parents and, and how they shaped you in this adventure. Well, my uh, father was a, um, as you say, a career army man. And um, my mother was a wonderful classical pianist. And I think uh, it was because of that. My father was not a martinet, but he was a disciplinarian. Mm -hmm. And looking ahead in the years, that's how I ended up going to school and getting all my degrees in four years with uh, my father right behind me. But my uh, mother was, as I said, a wonderful musician. And uh, when they came, they were both Chicago people, and when they came to Iowa City, my father had been assigned as an ROTC officer. And um, when I came here, I still met some people that remember him or remembered Colonel Muma. Muma? Muma. And um, we lived in a house on the corner of Court and um, Summit Street, but just behind the Adelot House. And I saw it. And then one month later, it was torn down and an apartment building was put up. But I did see the house where we lived. And my mother studied with um, Clapp the whole time she was hmm. here. She was here for four years, had three children, had some wonderful training from Mr. <laughs> Clapp and went to Hawaii. <laughs> now, you have a sister. Who, was she born here also? Yes, my sister and brother were both born here. My sister Antoinette and my brother Tony. Mm -hmm. And they're all out in California now. Then you, after your father's tour kind of up yes. here was up, you moved on to three or four different places. Yes. Did you look at that as kind of an adventure, or did you kind of resent having to move? Oh, no, I, mean, over. I don't think Army children resented how to, you know, because you have friends wherever you go. Mm -hmm. And I think it helps you um, settle and adapt 
because you have to do that periodically. I went to what Mother said, 12 schools in eight years. You know, you, you had to do that. However, um, my Army friends are still part of my life. And in fact, my closest friends are still girls that I grew up with at the Presidio when I was 10. Mm -hmm. And so there's a compensation. But no, it was just uh, my father's career. And we all packed up and, and went. And you ended up in San Francisco. That's where you went to high school? Yes, I ended up in San Francisco. Uh, at that point, my father was stationed at Fort McDowell, which is on Angel Island. So we'd have to take a boat to go back and forth to shore. And every day we stopped at Alcatraz. That was fun. Oh, what an exciting yeah. time. Mrs. Capone would be on the boat sometimes. Oh, really? Mm. Visiting? Visiting. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, so uh, I went to Lowell High School, mm -hmm. and then um, I won a, a full-paying scholarship to Stanford when I graduated. But for many reasons, I decided to go to uh, the San Francisco College for Women, a Sacred Heart School, where my sister was going. But you had kind of a burnout after a year and a half. Oh, yeah. Well, I'd done nothing but study, I think. And, and I burned out. And um, my father was very upset. But my mother said, uh, go ahead, Valerie. Take, mm -hmm. take, take time off. So I did. And I worked uh, in a motor pool at the Presidio, counting gasoline cans, as I recall, and uh, took my nurse's aid training, the Red Cross nurse's mm -hmm. aid. Then went back to school for um, a year. Mm -hmm. And so that gave me two and a half years. And then I said, no more. And so I did not uh, go back to school again until I was 37, and my father made me. And your father, well, I want to know, before we get to that, when you're 37, tell me about some of the adventures you had at that, during that time span, all those different careers you had. You were in Hawaii for a while. Oh, yes. Is oh, that yes. where you learned to hula dance and no. you were Don the Beachcombers yes. publicist? Yes. Now, come on, there's a story in that. Tell me about this. Well, no, I went to, um, uh, when I was 21, I went to Germany and uh, as a secretary. And uh, someone heard me sing, and I had been studying voice. And uh, someone heard me sing, and I looked Spanish. And they said, would you like to be in a soldier show? Mm -hmm. I said, what's that? Well, it's just they we have a group of talented GIs, and then they would hire these civilian actress technicians, as we were called. And because I looked Spanish and was there, I was Chiquita Banana in a <laughs> show called Swing Time Fiesta. <laughs> and, um, then, because I looked Hawaiian, Hapa Haole, um, I was with the very successful show called Song of the Islands. And um, my name was Uelani. 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 And does that mean something? I think it means beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but I hope <laughs> it does. And I could play a ukulele. And so I learned two hulas and went out on the road with the Song of the Islands and was hoping that no one would ask me for an encore because I only knew two. <laughs> uh, so when I came home from, from Germany, I went over almost immediately to be with my sister in Honolulu. Mm -hmm. And there I studied with the pupil of Iolani Luahini, who was the great classical hula dancer, and just incredible. And she knew all of the chants and the rest. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was during that time that I worked for Don Beachcomber, and I was a disc jockey uh, on an armed forces radio station. Did you like that? Oh, sure. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> I bet you liked everything you, most everything you've, you've tried and uh, experienced. But you know, Ellen, it, it's so strange because, you know, I just happened to be there at a certain time and, you know, it was not, none of these things were really planned mm -hmm. that I could see. But, you know, then when I came home, I studied more hula with a wonderful dancer named Kuchi Kani. And mm. I think she kind of danced in, in local bars, but she was a marvelous repository of the Hawaiian language and of the ancient chants. Mm. So that I really did, um, I think, become quite proficient uh, in it. And I, I, I don't do it now, except every now and then at the senior center for, um, for the I group. I gave a course. You know, I gave a course. I heard that you get you taught some hula dancing there. Did they enjoy it? Oh, sure. It's like aerobics with a, with a beat. Well, with a beat and <laughs> with a little sway. With a little sway. That's great. Yes. Now, when were you the CIA secretary? Well, I, that was in... Um, 54 and 55, and it was um, uh, uh, in Berlin again. I had been singing when I came back with the San Francisco Opera, 
in the opera chorus and studying. And I had small, small roles. And then when I was 26, I lost my voice. And I had to have it rebuilt by um, an otolaryngologist and a very good voice teacher mm -hmm. in a bel canto tradition. And so at that point, uh, I said, I think I'm going to go back to Germany. And I did, and that's how I ended up in Berlin, mm -hmm. uh, which was a fascinating time because there was before the wall, and um, you could, uh, we couldn't go into the East part, so the mm -hmm. intelligence people could not go into East Berlin. But um, uh, there in the West, they had opera every night. Mm. They had three symphony orchestras, and it was the most fascinating city, and the people were wonderful. And so I, I stayed there until my mother became ill, and my father wanted me to come home. But you, but you brought her to your, well, your mother yeah. while you were in Berlin. Mm -hmm. I brought her, and um, then I took her on a tour of Europe, you know, mm -hmm. and we went down to uh, Lourdes. And uh, there, uh, mother claims, her doctor did too, it was a minor miracle, because all of the burns that she had from radiation completely disappeared. She took one of the, you know, several of the baths mm -hmm. in, the, in the blessed water. And that trip, meant a, that whole experience meant a great deal to her. Mm -hmm. And then I took her down to um, visit our family in northern Italy, and then down to um, uh, Rome, to Assisi, you know. So uh, it was a You were her tour trip. guide then, I you? was her tour guide because I'd done it all when I was, uh, you know, about six years before when I was... Uh, Ooh, Alani, Queen of the Islands. Every time I could take <laughs> off, I'd take a trip. I want to ask you, when you were during this period in Berlin, during the, it was the Cold War, mm -hmm. were you ever in danger? Did you ever feel in danger? Well, there were several occasions in which we were told that the um, Kate de, the, the communist police, were going to come across in the uh, underground, in the mm -hmm. U-Bahn, because you could go back and forth, east and west. And so when this was given, we would um, um, go up and put thermite bombs on top of the safes and set them. And then we would retire uh, to our apartment because there was no way that there would be any um, escape in mm -hmm. West Germany. We used to be put through, you know, have a little bag packed and, and go through a trial evacuation. But there's no place to be evacuated from in Berlin. And we were told that... Um, they would just pitch barbed wire around and th that we would be there. So every now and then they'd, they'd tell us to go to the West and, and get a break because it did have its tension. Mm -hmm. But the uh, city itself was, um, it was, it was really something. And then you came back after Berlin to San Francisco, is mm -hmm. that right? And uh, you had another interesting job. You worked with immigrants. Or was that oh, no, later no, on? Was no, there no. something after that? No, uh, I worked for the American President Lines in the executive office. And then I was, um, by General Joseph Swing, uh, who was commander of Sixth Army, I uh, had been, he became the uh, head of immigration. And he called and said, would you like to run a program called Port Receptionists? And I said, what are they? Well, he said, we want to get very pretty bilingual young women <laughs> to welcome people to the United States because this was part of a big uh, Commerce Department campaign. And your languages were? Um, Italian? Italian, German, French, Russian, um, Polish, and of course Spanish. Mine were Italian and German. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I did that for two years and uh, ran a school for them at the Kennedy Airport. It was Idlewild then. Mm -hmm. And I would get Revlon to come out and make them up and help design a uniform and, and the rest. And it was a, a marvelous program, I thought. Mm. Um, but at the end of two years, my father thought that I had been banging around long enough. Mm -hmm. And my mother had died um, about five years before. And where was he stationed at this at time? At this time, he was retired, and we were living in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And so he had come home from Japan and retired. And so uh, his project became the education of Valerie. <laughs> <laughs> and someone said, how did you finish? How did you finish so fast? And I said, if you had a colonel with his foot in your back, you would too. <laughs> so here you were, fifth, uh, 37, excuse me. Yes. And your father is saying, Valerie, I think it's time you finished your college degree. That's right. And so you said, of course. Okay, of course. 
Okay, he's a colonel. He's a colonel, but you know, he could, he's a, he was just so delighted. I'd be there eight hours a day studying. I mean, I hadn't read a good book. I'm going to be honest with you. I hadn't read a good book in, in those years. Mm -hmm. And I was there taking 22 and 23 units a semester and then leaving immediately to go to Stanford. And that was, a, I think, one of the hardest things. But he kept saying, aren't you happy, Valerie? Oh, I said, I am. Were you? No, of course oh, not. You're miserable? <laughs> well, it was, it, was, it was just such a, um, a constant, you know, it was a boom, boom. Mm -hmm. I don't think I learned very much, it seemed to me, because I was so <coughs> pushing to finish, you know. Yes, but in, in retrospect, yes, I liked it. And yes, I did well. And you got your M.A. With, uh, doing a dissertation on Willa Cather. Yes. How did you happen to pick Cather? Well, uh, I have always loved Willa Cather. Mm -hmm. I've read all her works. I think My Antonia will go down in history as one of the finest American novels that there mm -hmm. are. Uh, uh, I loved her O Pioneer, Paul's Case, uh, The mm -hmm. Lost Lady. I read them, and I became fascinated with her as a moral realist, because this is what she was. All too often they say she was reactionary, you know, mm -hmm. and she just was looking to the past and everything. But she was a moral realist, looking for the moral realities in life, and a magnificent writer. Mm -hmm. So I was very glad to do my uh, thesis on her. And then on the, master, on the Ph.D., I did it on Joseph of Arimathea. Um, uh, what, what, made, what was the impetus to, to change uh, your direction of, to this time to, period? Ah, well, I think uh, my, my mentor at Stanford, uh, Professor Ackerman, said, Valerie, you can work in six languages, seven languages. And he said, your teleology is medieval. And I said, what's that? What okay. is teleology? Tell our viewers, what is teleology? It means last things. And I said, oh, I said, do you mean I believe in heaven, hell, and purgatory? Yes, I guess <laughs> so. And he said, you should be a medievalist. So that's what turned me to um, concentration in medieval mm -hmm. studies. And I really, um, uh, I've always been fascinated by the Grail legend. I know we were talking about mm -hmm. Jungian mm -hmm. um, interpretations of that and the rest. And so I became very interested in knowing why this a very pious Jew, Joseph of Arimathea, got wound up with a big Christian symbol. And that's how I did my dissertation. And during this time period, I r read that your father was attending some of your classes and oh, sitting in. Oh, yeah. He's right there behind you. Well, and but he also, one professor said, um, really, Miss Ligorio, this has never happened at Stanford. And I said, well, you know, it's costing him a lot of money. And <laughs> I think I'd like to see that he's getting his... And he agreed that he was getting his money's worth with you, but the 19th century man didn't uh, tow the mark, so... Oh, that's a great Isn't story. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And, and right during this time, though, he became ill, did he not? Yes, yes. And, and uh, he... Um, he... Uh, well, not seriously ill at that point, but then it gradually got mm -hmm. worse, so... Uh, he came and stayed with me. By this time, I was in St. Louis teaching at the University of Missouri there, and uh, then went to be with my sister in Boston mm -hmm. at the uh, Naval Shipyard, and finally with my brother out in Los Gatos. So uh, we, we're extraordinarily close family, as, as you can. Mm -hmm. um, I can imagine. Yeah. I think when you moved around a lot, besides your Army friends were good friends of yours, you must become very close As to your family. siblings. Oh, yes. Tell me just briefly about your sister and brother. Where do they live? Uh, well, now uh, my sister lives out, um, it's at Aptos, you know, it's about, she said it's a half hour to the Carmel Beach. Mm. And, um, uh, and she is a Navy widow, and she has three children. Mm -hmm. um, little Val, who is getting her doctorate in epidemiology. Um, named after her aunt. Named after auntie, yes. <laughs> I'm Auntie Val to everyone, I Auntie think. Auntie Val. Auntie Val. And then uh, my, um, uh, uh, my niece, Renee, I helped her go to Cal, and she is now running a program for Alzheimer's patients mm -hmm. in um, uh, Santa Cruz. And so, um, and John went to Bowdoin, and he's a sea kayaker. I'm not quite sure where he's going to end up. But the point is there, that, that family, too, is very close. Mm -hmm. I think we all are. And then my brother had six children, and he's a very successful attorney. Mm -hmm. And the one thing he wants to do is sail. 
Oh, yeah, that's so good. he has a, a, a beautiful sailing boat called the Endymion. He bought it from um, Stanford. And I think, I think some disgruntled romantic classical scholar or something said, I'm going to give this boat a name, Endymion. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I think, a rather unsuccessful poem by John Keats. If oh, I, if, if you know. <laughs> and my brother said, do you know what Endymion is? And I said, yes, but I know. I do. <laughs> but we go out in it. He takes me outside the Golden Gate. He's a wonderful sailor. And he's coming for this wonderful honor that you're going yes. to have bestowed upon you, yes. two fest trips yes. this next week next in week. Iowa City. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. And that's nice he could be here. Oh, I'm thrilled. Yeah. yeah, I'm thrilled. How did you get, you were down in St. Louis, and there's another part of your story that you learned to read mediev uh, medieval manuscripts uh, under a paleo paleographer. Uh, paleographer. Yeah. Tell me about him and his influence on you. And well, it was great. Uh, it's a very rare thing when you can receive training in this. Um, our paleo, paleo, paleography is old writing, you know, paleography. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, my, my mentor was a man named Chauncey Finch, who... Great name. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> he was a great classical scholar. And I worked with him very, very often for five years. And then after I moved to Iowa, I went down. And what he did was to, uh, we worked in the Vatican Film Library, which has microfilms of all of the Vatican manuscripts, mm. or the majority of them. And so what you would do is you, you'd look, you'd read, you'd learn to date a manuscript by the writing. And I can do that with Latin pale in Latin paleography. He, of course, could do Greek as well. But mm. it became fascinating for me just to sit there and to have some, uh, some man <laughs> communicating, some scribe sitting there, and suddenly, it's 820, the year 820, and here I am reading it, and there's a bond, you know? Mm -hmm. There's a bond. Uh, <coughs> the, the, well, of course, manuscript study, I think, is one of the most important facets of medieval work. Mm -hmm. the, and the, I, w I was never a great textual scholar, but I knew a great deal, and I could teach it. So that's where that came. And how did you get to Iowa City? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, it all because of Professor Carl Klaus in the English department. I met him uh, through the Midwest MLA. I was on the board. And um, he came back and he said to John Gerber, I have just met a very interesting woman, and she's a medievalist. And um, so I was invited up to Iowa mm -hmm. and um, met John and Peggy Gerber and all of their friends, Ellie and the whole group. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with the university, you know, because it's a wonderful place. Mm -hmm. And then I got a telephone call from John <coughs> Gerber saying, this is kind of iffy, but if, but if we can work things out, would you like to come to Iowa? Mm -hmm. And so that's how it happened. And I bought my little house on Jefferson Street, which was then flooded by Ralston Creek. And you went to the, I read too in your bio that you went to First National Bank and got uh, your loan. My loan from, with my Bud, from Bud, Bud Houghton. Houghton. And then not only did he give you a loan, but he helped with your flooding of well, your house. Yes. It, it was just, I had eight feet of water in my basement. All of my library, all just of my notes. Just when you came? Just th three weeks after I came. And I was facing 14 hours of teaching. And um, but I came down, and here is this black, muddy water. And uh, mm. I went over and stayed with the Klauses. But I heard, and I know, Bud Houghton came over in a pair of tennis shorts and sneakers, and he had commandeered the last pump in Iowa City, and he came out and pumped the water out of my beast. Isn't that And I, I just do not, and so I, and the next morning when I came and I saw, you know, the, how awful it was, he was there, was all ready to go to the bank, drove up in his big car. Now he said, Valerie, I want to tell you, things are going to be all right. We'll take care of it. Please don't be worried. Oh. Where else could you possibly have that happen? And to this day, I adore Bud Hope. That's a wonderful story. Did you lose a lot in the flood of your... Oh, yes. I lost all my library. Mm. And I managed to have, I saved two textbooks and um, some of my notes. Mm. And then, you know, the trunks were down there with all the family pictures in them. You know, linens, all the stuff that you put. Yes, in, that you put in the basement. And it completely, it was completely wiped mm. out. But um, 
I survived. You survived. <laughs> Tell me, all, you taught for, let's see, you came in 72, uh -huh. and you retired in 92. 92. Um, what did you, what were the greatest rewards of teaching for you here at Iowa? I know you mentored a lot of students and graduate students, mm -hmm. Valerie, and you made a lot difference in a lot of young people's lives. No. But what did you get from it, personally? Oh, I think I think the students, the students are everything. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if you walk in, you're going into a room, Ellen, uh, and you're going to be teaching 30 to 60 students. You know, you walk in and it's showtime, right? And and mm -hmm. off you go. But I I really think. Um, the interaction with students was one of the greatest things, in fact, of all the careers I've had. Nothing. My father was right about one thing. I really love to teach. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and I had excellent colleagues. You know, Iowa, Iowa English Department is very special. Mm -hmm. And it has a fine national reputation. It has very good graduate training and undergraduate. And nice people. It's not a divisive place at all. Mm -hmm. And some people say, well, why don't you come back and see us? I said, because when I retire, I retire. That door closes and another's going to open. Mm -hmm. But I certainly can, can attest to the fact that, that it is students. It is the students. Absolutely. And then friends that you make in the profession. Mm -hmm. And you were instrumental in getting the Medieval Studies Department to include women medieval writers and historians. Well, yes, um, uh, we have a big, you know, there is a large women's studies group there, mm -hmm. but my, mine was the, um, they were the women who were called Christian mystics in the Middle Ages, and they were people like Julian of Norwich, you were asking about, Marjorie Kemp, uh, Catherine of Siena, Hildegard of Bingen, all of these great women, and there were some men too, but mm -hmm. uh, the point is that none of that had been offered oh. at at in, in any like medieval department and here these people are writing some of the most beautiful language the most beautiful works and they had sort of been set aside you know mm -hmm. for theologians well I said they're not writing for theologians they're writing for people like you and me and so therefore with that Rita Mary Bradley uh, a nun from St. Ambrose we founded this um, this newsletter and worked constantly to bring this material into academia mm -hmm. to make it part and parcel of academic studies. Mm -hmm. And we did it. And mm -hmm. now there's a whole group of young, wonderful scholars who are devoted to this. Isn't that? And Hildegard is, I mean, you walk into any records or store Isn't and there's marvelous? chance and, I mean, it's, it's coming. Well, it's coming, Valerie. It's coming. It's coming. Also, she has um, she has um, a book on medicine, and she has uh, wonderful uh, visions. And oh, she's wonderful, wonderful. How do these Christian mys mystics speak to us in 1995? What do you think their message is, or do they have a message? Oh yes, I I think they have. Um, well, I think the whole the whole group. Uh, we're going. We're we're going through. At least I see it as a spiritual revolution now, uh, really. And it wasn't just the age of Aquarius in the '60s, but I'm sure, in so many ways, I think um, uh, we're looking for meaning. Mm -hmm. We're looking for answers. And I like to think it's because this is an apocalyptic age, Helen. We're approaching what the year 2000, right? Mm -hmm. Necessarily. And so what these people have, it is a message of hope. It is a message of love. Um, uh, it is, it is a, a message about the centrality of, of God to one's life. And people are reading these marvelous things. We have one, a modern one. I know you've heard of Thomas Merton. Merton. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I've read everything of Thomas Merton's. And what he says about the prayer life and the mystical life is the same as they said back in the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries. They're all describing mm -hmm. the same um, miraculous level of prayer. Mm -hmm. And I just like to think that their, their message is one really of hope and purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think it is. Your eyes light up. I can see this means a lot to you, this, this oh, yeah. uh, study for you. Uh, 
My last question is, you've retired, and so you've opened up a door to your whole, a whole new adventure for you. And I know you are at the Senior Center mm -hmm. giving lessons and lecturing on, on King Arthur. Yes. And uh, you've done hospice work and peer counseling. Tell me what this has meant to you, this volunteer work now in the community. Well, I, I, feel, um, I feel the most important thing in the world is to be needed. And I think that is what makes people happy. And um, I certainly wanted to find ways in which I would be needed. Mm -hmm. And so I started hospice about 10 years ago. And I still continue that. And then I went to the university hospital and I talked to the chaplains there. And so I'm a, a chaplain's assistant and work two and three days a week at university hospital. What do you do? Well, I, 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 go, and visit, I go and visit the parent and get, visit the patients, but I also bring um, the Eucharist. I can be a Eucharistic minister. And so I do that. And then the peer counseling is a program by the Johnson County Mental Health um, mm -hmm. Service. And it's run by Kathy Wallace. I, I, you probably know her, who is a marvelous young woman. And we are given clients, we're trained for 10 weeks, and then given clients, 55 and over. And you listen to them and try and, and be someone who can help them through various crises in their lives, mm -hmm. such as, um, again, leaving a home and going to a nursing home, or uh, family problems, mm -hmm. or poor health, whatever it is. And then, of course, you, you're with them. You meet with them once a week. And then uh, you always have a backup with mm -hmm. trained people. So, and at the center, I've taught um, King Arthur mm. and Chaucer in Middle English and Dante's Inferno. <laughs> and here are eight <laughs> the big questions, the big of, life. questions I, of life. And I, how are we to live? What are yes. we to do? But you know, I, I just said, well, no one's going to want this. But I had 20, 20 students in each class. And um, Betty McAllister, whom you know, wrote this article saying she called me her beloved preceptress, whatever that is. And <laughs> I was sorry, but she said, just because you're growing older physically mm -hmm. certainly does not mean that you are growing older mentally. And what most of them, what, um, what these women all wanted was very, very serious topic for study. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I worked out with June Braverman. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to be doing more of this. And you won a senior award from the Senior Center. Congratulations. Yes. yes. That's just, what, what another career for you. 29th. 29th. 29th career. And it's back into kind of human services, isn't mm -hmm. it? You've, you've come kind of full circle with yeah. that because you were a nurse's aide in San Francisco. Yes. Yes. And now you're working with the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. Well, Valerie, it's been absolutely <laughs> delightful, and I appreciate you coming and sharing your story. It's, it's quite a remarkable one. Well, thank you, Ellen, and I appreciate your asking me, and I love Iowa City. I know. My guest on One of a Kind has been the retired University of Iowa scholar and professor, Valerie Ligorio. In a testimonial speech in her honor, the following words were spoken, and I quote, we remember best her tireless efforts to make translations and editions of medieval works available to both scholarly and popular audiences, her mentorship of young scholars and graduate students, her encouragement of innovative scholarship of all types, her warmth, her humor, her zest, and intelligence." End quote. What more can one say? Valerie Ligorio is one of a kind.